Stephen Nachmanovich, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited for this this conversation. And I think I, I, I want to start by asking you probably the most difficult question for an improviser, which is to introduce yourself, because that's probably the thing you have to do over and over again. <laughs> yes, it's sort of a well, uh, the, the way you put that reminds me of certain jokes about Alzheimer's disease where where you have to keep uh, introducing yourself and so forth. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because in a sense, uh, um, an improviser um, uh, in one sense has no memory because uh, everything that you play is fresh in the moment uh, and is stimulated by what's going on in the moment. But on the other hand, you've got a three and a half billion year memory because you're a living organism and everything that you play is uh, somehow predicated on those three and a half billion years of organic evolution that we all share, you know, and that's why we're able to communicate with each other without rehearsing or writing it down beforehand. That's why we're able to communicate with other living organisms. Uh, and um, so it's an interesting thing. So in my um, more mundane introduction, um, I am a violinist, composer, writer, educator. Uh, I do multimedia art, um, visual music, and all sorts of art forms. Um, I'm sitting here talking to you from a swivel chair, and that's kind of the metaphor of my life, you know, is being on a swivel chair between between various forms of expression. Um, I started out um, thinking I was going to be an academic. I was interested in biology and then I was interested in psychology and that's where I got my degrees, um, psychology and anthropology, literature. Uh, I'd been uh, trained as a classical violinist as a kid, but I always thought, even though I always loved music, I always thought that that would be uh, um, something to the side of mm. my profession. And then in my 20s, I discovered improvisation and uh, discovered that much as I love composers, I didn't really need composers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that they're a luxury, but not a necessity. Uh, or that is that you yourself are the composer uh, and, uh, you know, creating and uh, performing are part of the same act. Uh, and I got involved in, I'm a violinist, I did uh, a lot of solo improv concerts, I did a lot of group concerts with other musicians, with dancers, collaborating with theater people, uh, collaborating with uh, all kinds of people in different fields. And out of that work came two books. Um, my first book, Free Play, is 30 years old now and is still going strong. And uh, that is more about the inner and spiritual dimensions of the creative process and spontaneous creativity, improvisation, and so forth. And the new book, The Art of Is, which just came out recently, is um, more about the external, social, collaborative, ethical dimensions of the creative process. Mm. So they make a kind of bookend. Right. So I have not gotten to free play yet. I, I discovered you thanks to Audible saying, hey, here's some free books. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> the Art of Is is just an amazing title. Thank you. <laughs> In that, it, I mean, it, it's it's resonated with me and some of my friends, and also I can't think of a less marketable thing like someone waking up in the morning and going, "I want to discover the art of is." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was I was intrigued, and I have to admit, I only finished the book yesterday which is not how I like to do things. I like to give myself a week. And it's it's partly your fault because I, I listen when I run 
And every four or five minutes, you would say something that would make me realize I should not be listening to a book while I'm running. <laughs> so, so I it's kept nice having... to do one thing at a time, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel you know, I feel so um, productive. Like, oh, I'm getting my exercise in. I'm getting some nature, getting some vitamin D in my skin, and I'm learning and preparing for my podcast. And you kept pointing like this run that I'm on, this step, that cow in the field, that breeze, like, like it, it, it only, you know, kind of almost shamed me into presence. So it took me a really long time to, to finally finish. That's really great. Well, the longer you take to read it, the better in a sense, you know, because <laughs> it really, you know, as you say, um, it is about presence and it is about seeing what's around you uh, because uh, I mean, there's so many metaphors. Uh, Im improvising means responding to what's in front of you. That is the mm -hmm. art it is, responding to the world as it is. Um, I mean, here we are living in a world of a pandemic and in a world of, you know, onrushing ecological catastrophes. And that is the world we live in. And all of our fantasies, imagining science fiction, music, whatever creative form we take, um, is still a response to what is, and to who we are and to who we're with. Mm -hmm. And it takes time to absorb that, you know, it takes time to, you know, I did have uh, one of the things that I uh, frequently do, like, it feels like, in the long past now, when I used to travel and and do gigs. And uh, I was teaching at a university in Canada. And one of the things I do a lot, of course, is just uh, encourage people to be aware of environmental sound. And, you know, there's the sound of the children playing outside, or there's the sound of the bathroom door closing on the second floor above you to your left, and the hum of the light fixtures and all of the all of the sounds around us and we become the more we listen to sound and the more we hear where those sounds are coming from the more present we become in space and time and who we are and with our own body and the better we're able to spontaneously respond uh so then the um professor whose class uh, I was a guest in then emailed me a couple weeks later saying that uh, that uh, basically the class has, uh, has now been really ruined because now everybody hears the sound of the utilities and the air conditioner in the wall behind where the blackboard is, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and now they hear everything and they can't unhear it. Uh, and, you know, that's really, um, you know, it's annoying and it's a blessing, you know, when you have an interruption. We talk about interruptions as offers. So um, you can be a musician playing a piece of music that you may feel is very profound. And then the phone rings or there's a siren screeching outdoors. And you can regard that as a terrible interruption that is ruining your, exper your experience. Um, or you can find it as a piece of information that you can build upon and something that you can respond to and that you can bring people into presence with that. And uh, you then discover sounds that you never thought you could make before. Mm. Well, see, what, and you know, one of the things that's had the biggest impact of me of the book, and again, you know, I, I, you're right, it's a good thing that I've had to have it titrated over over three weeks to kind of let it sink in, is I realized the extent to which I brace myself, mm. <laughs> just on a global. Hey, about that. Well, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, open up the news, and I'm already braced yeah. for the latest catastrophe, right? So I'll brace myself for bad weather when I'm going out for a run. 
um, I'll brace myself professionally for a hard day's work or an, or an email critical of, of a piece of, of work that I've done. And, you know, the, the examples that you give in the book really sort of build from sort of the basics of yes and and of simply playing with offers and things like, you know, noises and smells and and then ultimately to like the most global issues of, you know, concentration camps and global warming and like, the you know, the idea that. Um, so, when, you know, in my 20s, I, I spent a, a bit of time in therapy and I remember the poem on my therapist's bathroom wall just above the toilet. And it was it was a rendition of a, of a Taoist saying, those who flow as life flows know they need no other choice. They feel no wear. They feel no tear. Um, they need no mending, no repair. And like, you know, it was beautiful. And I'd go back into therapy after emptying my bladder and, you know, contemplated for a couple of minutes. But like your book really showed me that like a, a way in to that kind of relationship with life, which can feel, you know, feel again, bracing like this year in particular has felt like uh, like I don't like I. I want what I want. I have all my preferences. And then there's a whole bunch on the other side of all this stuff that I know. Thank you. I don't want that. And to be reminded that saying yes to everything opens up possibilities. And it's it's a far more psychologically healthy and happy place to be. Yeah. Uh, well, you don't necessarily need to say yes to everything. <laughs> I mean, there are some things that we do have to refuse. And um, but um, you can refuse them knowing what what you are and who you are and why you're refusing and your refusal can still be a response. I mean, when you mentioned saying yes to everything, you know, there's certain there's certain things that uh, that people want to put you through that you have to say no way. You know? mm -hmm. um, but the way in which you say no way, I mean, the very um, the very last page of my book is about an attempted sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And um, the nun, uh, medieval Japanese nun Shotaku is uh, uh, in the in 1330 something is uh, you know, walking from Dokusan with her, with her Roshi, with her teacher. Uh, and uh, she's the widow of a general who died several years earlier. And she became a Zen student after that, and later became abbess of a very, very important temple in Kamakura, which was a, um, which for centuries was a um, refuge for battered women and um, which was rare in Japan, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, so the story that I end the book with is that she um, she's walking through the woods at night back from the teacher's hut and uh, a man with a sword comes out of the bushes and he's attracted to her and he tries to rape her and he threatens her with his sword. And all she has with her is a piece of paper in her sleeve that she rolls up into a fake sword and screams at him with this enormous shout. And there's such ferocity to her, her gesture that the guy drops his sword and he runs away into the woods. And the koan that became associated with her gesture says, produce this paper sword, which is the heart sword, and prove its actual effect now. So there's an act, you know, in, uh, in theater improv, they love to talk about yes and, and so much of um, whether it be theater, music, or any field in daily life conversation, has to do with really listening to people and accepting what's happening and responding and adding something to it 
Um, but here's an, an improvisational act of great refusal mm -hmm. that was so powerful because his threat to her did not stop her from being a responsive, spontaneous human being. Right. And, and that's, you know, what I get when in when you after you finish the story of, of Herbert Zipper, and then you talk about um, something that touched me very deeply, like climate change, like it seems when you read the news, we've already lost. Yeah. Right. And to say that, you know, and this, this guy who was composing music in Dachau and Buchenwald concentration camps, in, and and playing in an ensemble where most of them knew they probably wouldn't get out alive. Yeah. Like if that's, if they can do that, who am I to throw up my hands and say, there's nothing I can do here. And it was, exactly. it was just exactly. so powerful. Exactly. Um, so one of like the, the, the first reason I wanted to have this conversation, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher about health and health habits and health behaviors. And as I was listening, it occurred to me that there's so much uh, wisdom in your approach that we can apply to self-regulation mm. in, in response to the world. But I also didn't want to turn this into like improv becomes a tool, like, you know, like go into a business and teach improv to the middle managers so they can make yeah. more money. And right. I didn't want to turn it into improv into how I can improve my diet. But yet I do Good kind of, want, you. I do kind of want to go there, but I want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to, I don't want to sacrifice yeah. the, the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, what you, you just brought up a whole lot of issues that are all intertwined. And it's really, it's really great that you mentioned that. Um, first of all, when you talk about self regulation, um, I'm a violinist. So the violin is a very analog instrument. Um, you know, digital and analog I mean, digital means uh, like in the background here, there's a there's a piano keyboard. So a piano from the point of view of pitch selection is a digital instrument. You're either playing an A or you're playing the B flat next to it, but there's nothing in the crack in between. Okay, or in a computer, there's a one or a zero and there's nothing in between. Um, in the violin, in the double bass, in your vocal cords, uh, you're continuously sliding up and down a string. And intonation is a matter of sliding, finding a place, and very rapidly correcting yourself, you know. Uh, and uh, if you've practiced a lot, you know, those corrections become inaudible and invisible. And um, let's say in a more mundane thing, in a more mundane example, we're all driving cars and you're constantly wiggling the steering wheel right and left and right and, le right and left. Your purpose is to go straight, but because of all the variations in the wheels of the car and in the shape of the road and the wind and everything else, the car is always minutely swerving to the right or to the left. And so you compensate by correcting, you know, the, the, um, the science of cybernetics, which, uh, uh, of course, now that word is kind of, uh, it connotes robots or something like that. But um, it was the, um, how living systems and certain kinds of artificial systems can self-correct by feedback. And it's from the old Greek word for steersman. You know, you're steering the rudder of the boat right and left and right and left. Now, when you're driving your car, you aren't constantly slapping yourself in the face and punishing yourself because, oh, I was too far over to the left. Now I've got to wiggle the wheel to the right. Oops, now I'm a little too far to the right and I've got to wiggle the wheel to the left. You know, you're just constantly smoothly self-correcting and moving the wheel back and forth so that you can go in a straight line. 
<laughs> and that's steersmanship, that's self-correction, that's what your blood temperature does as it wavers above and below 98.6 Fahrenheit or 30, 37 centigrade. It's what all of the, uh, when you talk about health, I mean, all of the very, all, all of the variables that are constantly shifting and changing in your body are engaged in constant feedback so that they can be fairly close to optimal levels, but they're always a little bit above or below and always self-correcting. So our body is a vast system of self-correcting systems, which some, some of them, of course, get out of whack mm -hmm. and then you're in trouble and then you have to do big corrections. Um, and, you know, this is, a, this is the fundamental nature of improv because you're hearing something and you're responding to it and you're hearing something and you're responding to it and you realize, you realize that what I did before or what my partner need bef did before needs a little bit of this and now it needs a little bit of that and now we want to go softer, now we want to go louder. All these kinds of constant um, analog self-correction. Now the other part of what you addressed uh, about improv as a tool, um, that's something that I very much relate to because uh, we live in a very utilitarian society. I noticed over your left shoulder, I see the word play written up on the board above your, you know, uh -huh. and, um, you know, our society, uh, certainly since the rise of the Protestant ethic and capitalism uh, has been, um, but of course, before that also, has been so geared towards utilitarian purposes. And, you know, there's that preacher who invented that horrifying phrase, the purpose-driven life. Mm. Uh, <laughs> turned out to be a big money maker. And, uh, you know, the idea that um, we have to justify play because it improves kids' cognitive development so that they'll better get better grades in school, you know, or music education. Uh, when I was a child in Los Angeles in the LA Unified School District, every single school in LA, rich or poor, had two art teachers and two music teachers. Mm. And of course, those days are long gone. And uh, for many, many years now, uh, music educators, art, art educators, mm -hmm. literature educators have had to justify their existence by saying, you know, well, music, uh, uh, playing music uh, makes, you, makes kids uh, more cognitively adept and they'll get better grades. And the implication that's unspoken beyond that is that you'll get better grades so that you get into a better uh, high school, so that you get into a better college, so that you'll get a better job and make more money. And um, so somehow play is associated with the money reward at the end of the reign. Yeah, I, I remember yeah. reading, uh, I think it was John Holt was writing about um, John Dewey, saying there's a big difference between playing you know, this little piggy went to market with your baby and engaging in tactile stimulation of digits. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like as a as a strategy to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So I think it's I think it's a shame that we have to um, justify art or justify play or justify music. Which, in fact, the thing that makes play play is that it's self-existent. You know, you don't um, play in order to be able to have enough money to eat. You get enough money to eat so that you can play. You know, and play music, art, love, sport, all of these things that people engage in for love. These are the uh, purposes of life. And mm -hmm. everybody prefers uh, different forms, you know, uh, 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 the kind of music or play or sport that I like may not be what you like, you know, but everybody loves 
doing something and everybody loves to enjoy the the pleasure of watching other people do it well yeah. and that's why we live so so let me ask you more specifically about the the cybernetics since you have a background in biology and psychology as well as mu music and other expressive arts so when i'm driving my car i get instantaneous feedback that helps me steer so I don't have to think about it or I don't have to hit a pedestrian or a curb before I, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, if I'm driving at two in the morning and I'm exhausted, I might have to like go over the grill lines to be woken up to like, oh, I should head back. Um, in in other arenas, so like I'm, I'm also, um, you know, I was a child violinist and like I remember trying to hit what was it? Might have been an F or F sharp for Chardash. Uh -huh. da, 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 yeah. And how many months I was and just not get it, not get it, not get it. And the more I didn't get it, it wasn't like I was getting better the way I would with like playing basketball or a sport. Every time I missed, I would get more and more frustrated and tense and upset. So I wasn't open to the feedback because of the state I was in of achieving and performing. Um, and then also when people, you know, make bad food choices or lifestyle choices that don't serve them, well, the feedback in the moment is very delicious, yeah. right? Yeah. So how do you think about applying principles of play and improv and accepting offers, you know, when there's that, there can be that time delay where cybernetics is 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 interfered with. Yeah, I yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, or, uh, as with all of your questions, it's a great twenty five questions all rolled into yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first of all, when you're talking about learning Chardash as a child and missing that high F sharp. And um, so then what happens, of, of course, is you keep trying and you keep trying and what you're doing is practicing your mistakes. Now, of course, it's not always clear what a mistake is, but let's say in this case, we know what a mistake is and you keep practicing it. Yeah. You know, what I realized it was, it was an A. It was an A. Yeah, whatever it was. <laughs> it was the <laughs> it was. And, um, <laughs> you know, so. I think the advantage of improvising is that um, when you're playing a score, of course, there are many musicians who are, you know, wonderfully adept at picking up any score of anything and reading it and playing it right away. But the advantage of improvising is that rather than making that huge leap that you keep missing, you can make a different leap, you know, you might make a smaller leap that is very satisfying. And having done that, you can make a bigger leap that is also satisfying, you know, and you're not trying to play a score, you're starting from where you are, you know, once again, the art of is, you're starting from where you is, and you're gradually increasing the range of the pitches that you can stretch to comfortably with that feeling of accuracy. And by accuracy, we mean that it resonates, you know, that you play it, if you play a tone that's, that's in tune, it's making the wood of the instrument resonate and it's making the room resonate and your body resonate. So you have those multiple senses of feedback that are going on. Uh, so with improvising, you rather than have some goal set for you by the composer of the score or by the teacher, um, you get there from where you is. Um, the other thing about uh, the long uh, chains of feedback you know, that aren't, you know, as you say, if you're driving, you're, um, you are getting immediate feedback on where you're going and where you need to change and how to shift and so forth. And that's also true of playing music. If you're playing music attentively, 
or doing a sport attentively, uh, you can you get all these feedbacks usually from multiple different sensors, uh, and you can adjust as you go. Um, I've had the experience. Uh, okay, so free play. My first book. I'm sure the thing. If I live long enough, uh, I'm sure I'll have this experience with the new book as well. But with Free Play, which I wrote throughout the 1980s, and it was published in 1990, and then um, it started getting a lot of translations in foreign languages beginning 25 years after it was published. Um, and uh, there I was a few years ago sitting in Japan where the new Japanese translation had come out, and um, I was getting feedback from people on words that I had written 35 years before. And it's really, really, you know, it is a wonderful feeling to have been, you know, sitting and struggling with those words 35 years ago. And then today, you know, it gets fed back at you from someone in Japan. Uh, and, uh, you know, those long, long, long feedback loops are very satisfying. But in the meantime, during the 35 years, you know, you, um, you need to feed yourself with experiences that exercise your art and give you a sense of immediate uh, understanding of what you're doing you know and I, I, sometimes of course people will do will get very very discouraged because they aren't getting the feedback and then if you live long enough the 35 years rolled around and lo and behold uh you got it you know back to the example of traffic uh close to the beginning of the art of is i give another traffic example uh you know when we're talking about steering the car you are in this sort of intimate sensory relationship with your uh, with the car, with the steering wheel, with your feet on the pedals, with everything around you. But driving on the freeway uh, in traffic, you're also involved in this improvisational social dance with other people. Uh, if you're on stage as an actor or as a musician, you may be looking into the eyes of your partner and uh, seeing their body language and getting immediate feedback about what's going on and how they're responding. Uh, in the case of people driving other cars, you're not looking into their eyes, eyes. You usually don't see them at all. All you're seeing is these large, blunt-nosed, fast-moving objects, and they're only communicating with each other by changes in momentum. And yet we somehow successfully use that feedback. So there are some accidents, but most of the time we don't get into accidents and we're able to do this very complicated, many body problem mm. dancing in the freeway. And that's such an interesting example of analog versus digital. Now that we're having self-driving cars that yeah. are going to be algorithmically driven and i mean that's fascinating because like when i read that it totally changed how i thought about communicating in a vehicle because what i had thought about like the only ways i communicated in a vehicle are with my horn or my the eloquence of my middle finger <laughs> <laughs> and what i realized after reading the art of is is that those are both the results of failures of primary forms of communication which is sort of motion and angle. Yeah. Uh, that, I, that, yeah. I, that, that, that is, that me driving is a form of communication before right. I have to, uh, you know, become explicitly upset with someone. That's right. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the things I was thinking about in terms of like, okay, so if I eat a piece of chocolate cake now, I'll feel good now, but maybe in an hour or a week or a year or 10 years, it will have some sort of negative consequence that it's hard for me to think about is your description of the organ playing John Cage's 
600-year-long composition. Yeah. Can you talk about that? That, was, <laughs> that blew my mind. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I like about thinking about this stuff is that, you know, we think about improvisation or whatever you want to call it, spontaneous creativity as, uh, you know, this sort of intimate millisecond by millisecond thing. But um, just as your three and a half billion years of experience as a member of organic evolution is really, you know, it's a very long business. Um, I mean, Cage had this wonderful um, relationship to time, you know, there was like the respect for the immediacy of the external noise that was coming in. Uh, but he also wrote uh, pieces that were very, very long. And in the case of uh, this piece is called As Slow As Possible. And it lasts for 639 years. It was, uh, um, uh, it's about uh, uh, a little bit less than 20 years into into its execution. And they, there's a, been a little, um, uh, there's a church in uh, Halberstadt in Germany uh, that has a specially built organ that was uh, constructed for um, playing this piece. And every few years, you know, the, the score calls for somebody to, uh, you know, change, to shift a lever that begins the playing of the next chord. And um, have you been there? No, I have not been there. I would <laughs> love to go. That would be really awesome. But the, the sense of operating over very, very long periods of time and being sensitive to it in an improvisational way, you know, and by improvisation, I don't mean being uh, fast or clever. I mean being aware of your environment, which is also very slowly changing. It's changing at all different speeds. I'm living here in the forest in Virginia. This year, my big creative project has been uh, an album of music that I played with the local birds. Since I can't, quote, go anywhere, uh, I go on walks in the woods and I've been collecting um, bird song on a recorder and then bring it into the studio and add violins and other things to it. Uh, so I just released an album called Hermitage of Thrushes. So the interesting thing about the birds is that uh, songbirds average about 450 heartbeats per minute. We average about 80, plus or minus. Hummingbirds apparently are like 1,000 beats per minute, which is, you know, hard to believe. Um, but meanwhile, there's the trees out there, which are also sentient beings operating at a very, very different time scale, you know. And if it happens that there's no sequoias where I live, but, you know, then you're talking about organisms that are operating at a thousand year time scale. Um, and so you have organisms that operate at all different scales of time, all of which manage to occupy the same planet in an interactive system. And that's really fascinating. And um, certainly Cage's piece is one of many projects where people have attempted to uh, be aware of, uh, you know, there's something called the Long Now Foundation, you know, be aware of the long now, the present that lasts for a very, very long time. And can you be improvisationally sensitive to very, very <laughs> gradual changes? Climate change is no longer, unfortunately, a very, very gradual change. We're, we're aware of it, you know, more um, intimately and disastrously every year because we didn't choose, you know, you talk about the person who keeps stuffing themselves with too much chocolate cake and it may take 10 years for them to really feel the consequences of that. You know, that's kind of what has happened to us with climate change. 
And so to be sensitized to the very quick and the very long distance changes is really important. Right. So, so something I've been playing with as a theory since being enmeshed in the art of is, is the idea of so, you know, like sensitivity to your environment, being, being fully present for it. Um, I'm wondering if anyone could like really mess themselves up from that place. Like, like, the, the, like when I talk to people about, oh, I binged on, I ate a sleeve of Oreos or I, I ate, you know, I, I went and got ham, you know, McDonald's or something and they ate it all up. They think they're doing it for pleasure. But um, like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to continue to ask 30 questions in one because this just reminded me of something else I thought was just, was just brilliant. In, in the book that I actually stopped and made a note on my phone to remember it is like the thing that came to me, and I don't remember what you were, what you know, the, the narrator, Robertson Dean, amazing voice, was saying. It was great. Um, while, while I did it, but it was that the problem for people who are binging isn't a lack of self control, but too much self control. Because they're trying to control every aspect of their experience in the moment. And if it's if I'm not feeling the way I want to feel, then I can fix it with a drink, some sugar, a cigarette. Yeah. Um, so I guess like, like could you know could be an improvisational mindset and set of practices be all that we need to free ourselves from uh, obsessive, self-destructive behavior? Uh, I don't know if it's all that we need, but it can help. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, but yeah, when you talk about um, feeling discomfort and that you have to fix it right away with a dose of whatever it is that you may then become addicted to. Um, I mean, part of, um, part of this mindset that we're talking about, the improvisational mindset, is being comfortable is learning to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, people, if you're on stage as a musician, actor, dancer, speaker, whatever, you're on the spot, you know, and sometimes you have nothing to say. <laughs> and having nothing to say can be wonderful because it can introduce pauses in your speech rather than having to fill it up all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, teachers um, are under so much pressure to have the syllabus filled out for the whole next year of what they're going to do in class every five minutes in order to justify the existence of education. Again, you know, back to the utilitarian, money-oriented mindset of our society. Um, and in fact, having silence, having nothing to say, being uncomfortable in the classroom, and allowing the child, adult, whoever the participant in the classroom to be quiet and to wait until there's something to say and to experience that discomfort is great. You know, discomfort is great because that's where all creativity comes from. Which and uh, which brings up an, another issue, I think, that people have a lot of confusion about or difficulty about in, in the people that I coach who are trying to like improve their lifestyle is it feels like there's a big um, tension, a, a, an either or between spontaneity and being and planned. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought that way too, until I, I heard you talking about the Japanese tea ceremony. Yeah. It's, it's like, like it's, it's both, right? It's incredibly like ritualistically planned and it also has tremendous room for maybe not like not improvisation in terms of well I'm going to do something different, but but in subtle ways, 
going to be malleable to the experience of the now. Yeah. Um, one of the one statement that I came across after the book was published, which I would have loved to have included in it, there's a chapter called non verbs and nouns, uh, where I talk about stamping out nouns, which mm. was a favorite phrase of my teacher, Gregory Bateson. And um, to come closer to being a verb in continuous process. Um, weirdly enough, in that uh, chapter, I quote a Republican president who started as a general, Ulysses S. Grant. But then this quote that came to me later after I published the book was from another general who became a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> and in 1950, whatever it was, when Eisenhower was president and he came to give a speech at a war college, he said that um, plans are worthless. Planning is everything. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out that, um, you know, what you're planning for, especially if you're in the military, but it doesn't matter what field you're in, um, what you're planning for, of course, is going to be an emergency. And an emergency, by definition, is something that you cannot predict. And so any plan that you make is going to be worthless when the emergency happens. On the other hand, planning, which is an ongoing activity, which is practice, you know, to try to plan for things, even though you know that the plans will never be appropriate to the exact thing that happens, makes your mind flexible and uh, makes your chops flexible. And so you are able to respond in the moment because you have spent time planning rather than sticking to your plans. Mm. Yeah, and and, um, and I love how you put it at one point that like, I can't remember the exact phrase, but this spoke to me as someone like I've for the last two weeks, I've been improvising on the violin, and just like playing with it and having oh, nice. a lot of fun. That the all my practice is, is not to prepare the piece, but to prepare me. Some, yeah. some, something, something like that it was like that yeah. I am, I am the product of the preparation and not anything external to myself. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, right. Because I get people who are like, well, I, I don't know what I'm going to want to eat for dinner in three days. Like they're at the supermarket trying to make good decisions. And they'll say, well, I, you know, I can't be pinned down. I need to be spontaneous. And that, that perceived need for spontaneity me it plays out that they're continually making last minute bad choices <laughs> according to their own priorities, right? Because of this um, allergy to making plans. Yeah. And I thought there's there's something in 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 the way you talk about that that can can destroy that binary. That's right. Uh, all binaries need to be destroyed. That's <laughs> that's part of it. I mean, also when you imagine when you're talking about the supermarket, um uh you're at the supermarket and uh, you may have uh, what you need for dinner tonight. And then three nights later, you have leftovers of four different meals that are sitting around in the refrigerator. And uh, you find, and especially in the time of pandemic, when you don't go to the supermarket all the time, you find yourself combining those ingredients into something really interesting and innovative. You know, you find yourself improvisationally inventing dishes mm. out of those leavings that are really, really quite interesting, which you would never have been able to actually think up a recipe before. You're just throwing things together and finding, hmm, this tastes interesting. I'll do a little more of that. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the, the joy of the, of the power of constraint. Yeah. Right. Like there was another quote about like, you know, having 360 degrees of freedom is uh, is paralyzing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
So something else I wanted to talk to you about in terms of like towards the end, things get really heavy about like what we're going to face in life, like the yeah. inevitability of, um, well, what, what is mistranslated as suffering, but is, you know, sort of attachment to form um, and Herbert Zipper's fascination with his own um, lung cancer um, and his fascination with the experience of, of, uh, of being a slave in a concentration camp. And then, and then the, the, the lighter version of that was um, your take on uh, Sixto Rodriguez uh, of Sugar Man. And, I, and I'd known about him because my wife is South African. Oh. And, and we met in London in 1989. And like, I, I wasn't a very hip person. Like, I, you know, I knew like the Beatles, and the, but I didn't know, you know, Depeche Mode or or the Eurythmics. I wasn't like, uh -huh. and then she mentioned this guy, Sixto Rodriguez, who, and she couldn't understand why I had never heard of him yeah. because he's the most <laughs> famous musician in the world. And I just, I just put it down to, you know, I'm kind of a nerd and I like classical music and 60s folk rock and I wasn't very... And then to discover only like we then to discover when the movie came out, searching for Sugar Man. Um, but I, I love your take on the you know, the equanimity of this man who was fine with being a day laborer in Detroit and being an international rock star in South Africa and being able to navigate both worlds with with a sort of a shrug of the shoulders. Yeah, yeah. That's a remarkable story. And, you know, I, so do you have um, suggestions for how I can get that? Because I can feel myself getting so attached to form, to this is how the way, this is how it should be, to that's the A I'm playing on Chardash from, from, when, from when I was little, to like these forms that correspond to, you know, treats and goodies. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in that um, in that very utilitarian sense, like what are some practices that we can do in our daily lives that are maybe informed by improvisation that can help us loosen so that we can, you know, we can say, you know, you may be right, like that Zen story about the, you know, continually changing conditions or just to, you know, to, to not be so upset when things don't go our way. In yeah. quotes. Yeah. Well, things very seldom go our way. <laughs> <laughs> and so sitting with that or walking with that, I mean, that's a, pra you know, simply um, being aware of the world, you know, I mean, meditative practice is great because to be able to sit on the cushion for a period of time with the body you have and with the mind that you have and with the world that we have around us um, and not go anywhere, not try to do anything about it is really a very valuable practice, you know, um, to be able to, um, you know, in the, 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 the meditative um, practices can be extended, of course, into every moment, theoretically, of course, every one of us, no matter how, um, how much practice we have is going to get caught up in the alarms and the emergencies and the freak outs uh, that, uh, that uh, we create for ourselves or that the world helps us create. Um, but to just know that you're when you're sitting on a cushion, you're following your breath, but also when you're at the grocery store, you can also be following your breath. Mm -hmm. And you could just have one moment when you remember to just breathe and do nothing. You can have moments at home when you just sit at the table and draw. You don't have to be a professional artist or know how to draw anything, quote, good, unquote. Um, but you can sit at the table and draw. You can sit at the table and write something. It doesn't have to be good. You can crumple it up and throw it away afterwards. That's 
you know, you can crumple it up in a really interesting way you know, <laughs> for the garbage can across the street and, you know, test your basket shooting abilities. Um, but to, um, to take time out to breathe is really great. Um, I like to say that uh, probably the most interesting and valuable socio-political invention of the last 4,000 years was the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, let's take a day. It doesn't matter whether it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or it doesn't matter if it's a half a day or however you do it and whether you associate it with a ritual or not. But to take time when you are able to do nothing and take in what's around you. And when you're that quiet, you're also able to examine your reactions, you know, your reactions or your responses. Um, so when you're an improviser, of course, your responses are, you know, they may be very quick and they may be, um, predicated on, you know, this great sensitivity to what's happening around you. But to slow down that process and just have an experience, have a sensory experience and get the sound of it, the sight of it, the smell of it, the touch of it, the taste of it, the imagination of it, and wait long enough to have a real response. And maybe that takes an hour. Mm. All right. And, and, and to then be willing to discern a real response from all the fake responses or the, the programmed conditioned responses that, yeah. that maybe that aren't authentically us. Yeah. Right. It's that, that inhibition allows us to learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, a while back, I, I was learning juggling. And what I discovered was three balls was easy. Yeah. And then trying to go more than that, three, my ability to do three balls was the thing that was stopping me. Right. So <laughs> that I, I actually had to learn how to inhibit things that were working. Yes. In order to get something that worked better. Yeah, in Alexander technique, um, uh, Alexander talked about inhibition a lot. You know, that's a that's a that's a very powerful word. You know, we often think of inhibition as being um, negative, but um, to really uh, to notice the kind of movement you're making and then not do it. Mm. And that, that was my, yesterday I was doing some fiddle improv and that's what I kept noticing that as soon as I liked what was happening, I started to become attached to it. So I was like, oh, I'm just I'm just going up and down uh, D, A and E strings pentatonically because that feels so safe. Yeah. And then I, I, I consciously, all right, let me try an F, an F sharp here. Right. And I'm aware that like my wife is in the other room and she might think, oh, that wasn't as good. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> like, well, like... the thing about the F sharp is that um, the first time you do it, if you're doing it in the context of the notes that you played, um, it sound, the F sharp sounds like a mistake. Uh -huh. So then you repeat it. <laughs> and then you repeat it a third time. And then the third time that you do it, it has now become a new, a new pattern that you integrate with the old pattern. Mm. So, you know, this is one of the things, uh, I mean, you may, uh, I mean, there are real mistakes in the world and you may decide, well, that was really no good. I'm never going to do that again, you know, but very often if it's a matter of just extending your, your skill in some way, and now you play an F sharp in the context of, C's, D's, and A's, um, those, uh, um, you're now extending your tonal palette. And what sounds like a mistake the first time becomes the new pattern. 
And the nice thing is that the new pattern integrates with the old pattern. Mm. And I and I love the idea of doing it like I'm in my home in my living room playing violin, like the stakes are actually really low. Right. And but it's a way for me to practice developing a relationship with mistakes that I can then apply. Like, you know, like there are places where a mistake is serious or deadly or unrecoverable from. And yeah. if if those are the only places that I have experience with mistakes, mm -hmm. I'm either going to be reckless or, or overly cautious. Exactly. Like to, to find places where, like I'm on, a, I'm on an old man's Frisbee team. And in the, in the old days when we could actually play and against other teams, our cheer before each game was the stakes couldn't be lower. Great. Right? Which like, so let's look, looking for opportunity where the stakes couldn't be lower. Because even though they're like, the, the stakes were low. It's still like I still had a little like adrenaline shot of embarrassment mm -hmm. at having having hit, you know, a note that I thought is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you one more, actually in that. Uh, I know we're coming to the end of this hour, uh, <laughs> but let me give you one more uh, practice uh, that relates to that um, that I do with a lot of well, people in all different art forms, and that's to make one minute pieces. Mm. Because people are often uh, inhibited or terrified by the idea of improvisation or creativity. And in fact, if I go to a universe, I go to a lot of universities and music schools and other other institutions. And of course, in order to uh, if you're going to have a, a, a um, event in auditorium A at 3 p.m. You have to put something on the poster that announces <laughs> that event. So I'm sort of stuck with having a label on it in that sense. But once I get people in the room, I hardly ever talk about improvisation. And in fact, I hardly talk about anything at all because we're all there together. <laughs> uh, and um, but one thing I have people do is one minute pieces because a minute is such a short period of time in our minds that it's really non-inhibiting and the stakes are very, very low. But a minute is also a period where your short-term memory is operating so that you can remember in second number 50, you could remember what you did at 10 seconds. And so you can actually do something structurally connected to it so you can complete the piece. Mm. So you can actually make a complete piece with a beginning, a middle and an end that lasts no more than one minute. And it's very satisfying. And because the stakes are low, everybody can do it. Everybody yeah. can do it. And in fact, you know, the uh, 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 Anton Webern, one of the uh, really innovative composers in the early 20th century. You know, he did uh, many pieces that were like 45 seconds long or something, you know. So you can really say a lot. Mm. And it's not intimidating. And you can do in a half an hour, you know, you and a partner can do 21 minute pieces. <laughs> Right. And now and now we can upload them all to TikTok. You can upload them to TikTok or you can decide that 18 of them sucked <laughs> and you delete them. But two of them were really good and you upload those. Right. And, you can get, you get a highlights still, reel. And you still and you still created, even if you throw out a lot of things, you've still created more than you probably could than if you sat down with a pencil and paper and scratched your head and tried to compose it carefully. Mm, I love it. I love it. Well, St Stephen, thank you so much. This is, you know, the book has made such an impact on my personal life and my practice. And, and like, like improv, like, that's not why I went, that's not why I listened to the audiobook. I wasn't trying to get better at anything. It just seemed, <laughs> you know, I was playing. And uh, so I, 
I want to thank you for for the work you've done in the world. Well, one one last one one last question. Um, and this might be hard for an improviser, but I I'd like to ask my guests some piece of music or a band or a composer that you're listening to now that, that most people haven't heard of. One or two. Hmm? Hun or two. Hun or two. How, how do you spell that? N H U U R T U is a very Tuvan throat singing band. Okay. They're really hilarious and really great. And, you know, these are the, uh, as in Mongolia and Tibet and other places in Central Asia, you know, they're able to do, you know, to each singer is able to sing the sound, the sound plus the overtones plus the undertones and it's really, really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried that once, I got one overtone and then I couldn't talk for two weeks. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Hun or two, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll find some links and throw that up. So okay. Stephen, again, thank you so much for the work you do and thank you so much for your time today. Take care, it was great to hang out with you. Okay, be well. Bye. Bye.